Welcome all of you to this live program of Authentic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Yuriko Lisboa Montero from Portugal. Dr. Montero obtained his medical degree in 2006 from the Nova School of Medicine. Subsequently, he completed his orthopedic residency program at the Central Hospital at Jao, Facultal de Medicine at the University of Porto during 2008 to 2014. He then pursued visiting fellowships at Munich in 2012 and 14 with Dr. Michael Deinst and in Zurich with Dr. Michael Lilik. Currently, he serves as the head of the hip and pelvis unit at the Hospital Cuff Porto in Portugal. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Yuriko Lisboa Montero from Porto, Portugal. Oh, dear, Rico. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a, a pleasure to talk about a subject that I personally appreciate. And I'm going to give you a little talk about peritrochanteric space disorders. This is the adaptation of a talk that I gave during uh, our national meeting for, for in Portugal for the National Arthroscopy Society and focus, focusing mainly on peritrochanteric space disorders. Uh, I'm going to uh, get you through all the bibliography that uh, was used to, to put together this talk, um, especially the, the main articles that afterwards, if you are interested, you will have my email and I can uh, give you all these complete uh, papers that were the, the, the foundations of, of this talk. Uh, especially uh, also two, two great papers, one from the American Journal of the, uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and the other one from the most recent book from Springer, uh, which has the main editor uh, for this uh, specific subject, Dr. Dr. Professor Chaino. Um, and also uh, my, my, my own chapter from the ESCA book uh, to which I contributed. And that if you also want to, to consult, I can uh, get, forward you the PDF on this the PDF file with this chapter. So let's focus a little bit on what we are talking about on, in terms of anatomy. We are talking of a space uh, to, with major uh, in tendon insertions, especially from the gluteus muscles, also with lots of bursa, uh, and uh, very related to the to the iliotibial band. So we are working in this space just be, just beneath the iliotibial band, and above the greater trochanter. And what is interesting also to to appreciate is that. Uh, there is some contribution from the gluteus maximus tendon uh, when we are talking about this space, because when we feel that we have a tightened space, uh, mostly like the, the subacromial spaces, if we use uh, a, a comparative anatomy, uh, some of these, some of these uh, contributions by the, the, um, the gluteus max uh, are important, as you will see, uh, later on this talk, we also address some problems regarding the, the gluteus max tendon. So it's also interesting and important to know superficial anatomy, uh, talking about the major facets uh, of the trochanter, especially the anterior, lateral, posterior, and supraposterior facet, and the correspondent uh, tendon insertions for the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and also the places where we can find uh, the major bursa uh, located on this place, like the trochanteric bursa, the subgluteus medius bursa, and the subgluteus minimus bursa. So when we are also checking on this uh, anatomy, we know that there is what we call the bald spot. The bald spot has no tendon insertions, so it's a very nice place or the perfect place to put our anchors uh, without damaging the the what, what's left of the of the tendon insertions. Also, it's a very good place since when we are doing our access, we can stick our needle to guide us 
during the procedure without damaging any muscle or tendinous structures. So there's, all, there's always this talk about what's compared anatomy between the rotator cuff and what we call the rotator cuff of the hip uh, regarding the functional anatomy. Uh, and we can see that the, the rotators are mainly the, the iliosoles, the stabilizers are the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. And what we need to, to, to work with, uh, with our abduction also from the gluteus medius and the tensor fascia lata. Uh, there's always pain over the trochanteric region. And I always check if the pain is mainly on the posterior facet or the supraposterior facet. And I also check if there is pain on the femoral insertion of the, the gluteus max because that gives me a pretty good idea if there is a contribution to this syndrome from the gluteus max. Uh, today we are using MRI on ultrasound. Uh, I think MRI is very useful in assessing uh, uh, mainly in incomplete tears. We will go through the classification in just, mo in just moments. But ultrasound is a very good exam, especially when we're talking about uh, some kinds of external snapping. Uh, since, it is, uh, since it is a dynamic exam, uh, we can check for the, for the, for the snap uh, with our, with our uh, ultrasound. So we know there are some risk factors for developing greater trochanteric pain syndrome like older age, obesity, hip and knee arthritis, lumbar pathology, uh, greater pelvic trochanteric index, a diminished sacred slope. And especially we have to check young ladies that are usually hypermobile, not hyperlax, but hypermobile, and always check and uh, to, to register the Baton score. They, all, they always have higher Baton scores. Also, we have anatomic uh, predispositions for these, for these syndromes, especially when there is an imbalance between the abductors and the ITB tensioners, but especially with lateral pelvic shift, and especially when we have uh, coxavara, uh, this uh, always puts a lot, lots of strain on the trochanteric region and increases the, the probability of developing pain or disorders over this region. Uh, I, I always take a lot of time doing my physical examination, uh, always check BMI, gait analysis, and always take time to, to explore your patients seated lying and standing because the, the pelvic relations uh, tend to, to change during these positions and always check lower limbs and spinal and spinal column because we know there is a very high association between hip spine syndrome and greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Most of the patients have pain over the peritrochanteric area. Uh, it's not always that uh, straightforward. Uh, when we have uh, ruptures or major dysfunctions of these muscles, we have a positive Trendlenburg, we have a diminished resistance of the gluteus medius, and sometimes we can even uh, test for external snapping. Uh, it's not always that straightforward when we have a Trendlenburg sign, because it, it's not always the case for a complete rupture, but sometimes we can have a partial rupture, more than 50% of the tendon uh, with the tendon dysfunction. So always remember that we have to exclude intraarticular pathology like AVN, dysplastic hip disease, FIA or labral tears, spine pathology and extraarticular pathology like nerve entrapments, muscle pathology, and some, 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 sometimes stress fractures. So going quickly through the classification that was published by the group of Lyon uh, by Mat Matthew Tono, uh, we have 
mainly four types of, of tears. We have grade one, uh, up to 25% of the tendon, grade two, 25 to 50% of the tendon, grade three, uh, 50, 50 to 100 to the to the 75 percent of the tendon and grade four uh, full thickness tears. Uh, there was also uh, a classification that was published by Lau. Uh, classification greater trochanteric pain syndrome, uh, with type one being isolated bursitis, which I think it's fairly rare to just have bursitis uh, isolated, uh, type 2 with trochanteric bursitis and fraying of the tendon, grade 3 with partial thickness tears, uh, less than 25% for the for the 3A and more than 25% for the 3B, the sign there is not correct, grade 4 full thickness tear and grade 5 full thickness tear with retraction. Uh, this is also important as we will see further. So I think regarding the surgical technique, I tend to use four portals, mainly the modified mid anterior, the pala and dala portals and the uh, posterolateral lateral portal if I need to, to work more posterior and more inferior. Uh, the the main working portals are this modified mid anterior. I do an ITB sparing approach. I don't cut the ITB band and I manage my sutures and my anchors through the pala and dala portals. Uh, I also mark, as you see there on the, on the photo, uh, this, the, the place where I think the bold spot is because that's the place where I tend to insert my, my anchors. I also place a, a needle, an arthroscopy needle, a traumatic one uh, in the bold spot and just let it stay during the procedure to identify the place where I am working. So I go with my scope towards the needle and once I find the needle, I start working on that space. So I've told you that I use an ITB sparing approach versus an ITB splitting approach. But what we tend to find is that uh, there, is, there are no major differences using an ITB sparing or an ITB splitting approach. Um, I find that if you use an ITB splitting approach, probably on your first cases will be much easier to, to enter that space. So uh, I use a 30 degree scope, just like in the shoulder. Uh, and I triangulate always using fluoroscopy to check for the right position and always to check for the right position and angle for placing my, my anchors. So before seeing some videos, let's go through what uh, was published in the, in the arthroscopy as the treatment algorithm for this kind of, of pathology. So uh, I think now we see that probably no difference between using a single row or a double row. A double row, of course, maximizes contact area between the tendon and the bone. Uh, but I would say that I use an, uh, an hybrid technique. I don't use a pure double row. I use uh, uh, like a suture Roman bridge, you will see um, later when I'm showing you the technique. But what uh, what we know is that we have to check, especially the, also the anterolateral portion of the of the tendon. That's where almost where uh, or uh, always where our our rupture is. So we can do a technique with a side-by-side -side closure if we have a partial or we have to complete a partial tear or use a standard technique for, for, the, the, cuff, for the, as we do for the rotator cuff if we have a complete tear. So in grade one tears, um, we can use several techniques. Uh, PRPs, if we, if, we, if we don't have that fraying, and we just want to add, to add biology to our tendon. Uh, 
please notice that not all PRPs are the same. Uh, we need at least six to eight uh, milliliters of of uh, PRPs to go for uh, to go for very good biological augmentation. Uh, about nine to ten billion platelets. It's what we need to enhance the uh, the recovery of this tendon. We can also do bursectomies or isolated bursectomies. And using the bold spot, we can do transtendinous, greater trochanter microfractures. So that's what we see here. I have my, my needle on the bold spot, just taking out of all of this bursa, uh, cleaning up the peritrochanteric space, exposing our tendon. Uh, you can see that, sorry. Also taking down the sub-gluteus -med sub medius bursa and exposing the minimus tendon down. Uh, you will see it in a moment. And also taking out our microfracture owl and performing the trans tendinous microfracture technique through the tendon and you we want to have this kind of image bleeding from the tendon uh, with good biological enhancement of the of our tendon in grade two tears when we don't we when we have less than 25 percent of the of, of the tear we can do a trans tendinous technique. There's a nice paper published by Benjamin Dom in arthroscopy doing that. We place our anchors through the tendon. And I use this hybrid technique where we, we just use two uh, proximal anchors and one knotless um, and one knotless anchor uh, placed uh, distally on the on the construction uh, i think this gives an excellent compromise between maximizing tendon to bone contact without compromising much of the tendon vascularity so in grade three tears uh, i think this paper from the leon group is very interesting because I think this is a very good technique and especially a very easy technique to do. We just complete the tear. We go underneath the tendon. We place our suture anchors and we close our tendon side by side. Uh, we have a side by side repair, which mechanically is stronger. We don't, uh, we don't disrupt much of the tendon and we also get some very good contact between the tendon and the bow and the bone to allow it to heal so this is an example where i put two anchors you can see the anchors being placed on the bolt spot the bolt spot is exposed then we have the anteromedial and the anterolateral leaflets of the tendon we use a suture passer exactly like the ones we use in the shoulder and we close down the we close down this this tear side by side using the two anchors that we have placed on the on the bold uh, spot. More difficult are grade four tears when we have a complete tear. Uh, we don't have that much retraction. When we go into the peritrochanteric space, we can see. The, medius, the, the gluteus medius leaflets, anterolateral, anteromedial, and we can see also the minimus tendon insertion. We go straight, uh, we face straight forward the bald spot. Sometimes we have some uh, osteophytes on that, uh, on that region that we have to clean exactly like we do on the shoulder. Um, then we can place our anchors and perform our repair. Uh, as I told you, this is uh, the technique that I tend to use. 
uh, I use a construction like a Roman bridge construction when in which we use two superior anchors and one more distal anchor, uh, an atlas anchor, just to just to maximize bone tendon contact. Um, and I think this gives us a very solid construction and a very uh, and a very uh, a very a very good construction that I think for rehab is important because I don't tend to wear hip immobilizers. I just put my patients on two crutches for six weeks and tell them to avoid the um, to avoid the active abduction uh, and for the six weeks and passive abduction for two weeks just until sutures from the portals come out they can also readily start cycling they can readily start water exercises by two weeks when they take the sutures from the portals and I think that, that that's a good rehab program without using uh, without using any kind of restriction for hip movements. So this is what you can see. I have the needle identify on your right, identifying the place where the the bold spot is. I'm completing the tear here, uh, as you see. There's the anteromedial and the anterolateral leaflet. Uh, I use an angulated R RF device. I think it's easier to work on this space with the 50 degrees rather than with the 90 degrees. I use a shaver to take all this fibrotic tissue from the tendon and complete the tear. Okay. As you see, the needle is there for visual guidance. I am exposing the bold spot. You can see lots of osteophytes there, as this is a, an old tear. So lots of osteophytes on the bold spot. Just take all this tissue out, debride just down to, should, should I say, healthy uh, tendon. This is the minimus tendon. We are now cleaning the bursa, preparing all the bold spot. You see very, very large osteophytes that probably damaged all, all this tendon and contribute not to not for the tendon to heal properly. So when we have all these exposed, we can see just all through all just through the anterior facet bold spot posterior superior facet we have now identified we are rotating the femur to expose more of the bold spot just see that this is not a true tendon fibrotic tissue the rupture goes well distally and just taking down all of these fibrotic tissue that will not allow us to get a, a good repair or a good healing on this tendon. I think we can go a little bit faster. Okay, inspecting all of all, all this area. Just checking for these osteophytes. Now through the place I marked as the as the bold spot, checking my my position for the anchors. Now checking the position for the for the cannulas. I use two cannulas, one through the dala portal and another one through the pala portal. Uh, these these are can these are this is the system from from Conmed. You, we can measure the depth of the of the soft tissues. We cut the cannulas. Specifically, specifically down to the side. Now with the grasper, we must assess if, if we have good tissue for for repair, or if we or if you have to do some more releases on the tendon, not to get the tendon very very tight on this repair. So again, we are just drilling the holes to put our 
anchors in. Second anchor in. And this is this is amenable to do a side by side repair as you saw there. I was pushing on the tendon and to see if there if the, there was possibility to, to do a side by side repair or if I had to do a triangular or Roman bridge construction. So we have our two holes for the anchors, good bleeding. The, uh, the anchors allow for these factors to come from the bone and get also some biology on, the, um, on our repair. Now, just using the shaver to clean up some bone, take some of these osteophytes down and make a smoother surface for the tendon repair. Just releasing a little bit also, just to get less tension on our, on our, on our, in our repair. Okay. Just releasing all the tendon through the surface, then placing our peak anchors. In our wires and now passing our we have the the two anchors with the, the eight wires and now using just a, just a normal passer or a suture passer going down getting good getting a lot of our tendon and then just trying to close up close the our gap and get a good position of the tendons and just cut down cut the wires so uh, a comparison between open and endoscopic procedures uh, the complication rate is uh, lower with the endoscopic procedures, uh, but the retail rates uh, are almost the same. Good, very good outcomes with both open or endoscopic techniques. And for both techniques, we have worse prognosis with old age, higher BMI, tobacco users, bigger tears, of course. And when there is fatty infiltration, our higher gutaliate, uh, higher gutalier classifications and poor tendon quality or when we pull on the tendon and there is fraying. For grade 5 tears, uh, I am doing this surgery open. Uh, we take a triangular flap from part of the gluteus maximus and part from the uh, tensor fascia lata. And this is a case with a patient who had a total hip uh, through a lateral uh, approach, uh, direct lateral, lateral approach with damage to the abductor tendons. We just took this flap from the tensor fascia lat and gluteus max, and we put it through the defect, anchored it with four anchors, for peak anchors, and then we close the limbs of the flap uh, over the, the flap that we left, um, suturing the remaining uh, tensor fascia lata through the, through the remaining of the, of the gluteus max. And is it possible to do it endoscopic? Uh, this is also published by the Leon group and from Matthew Tono that they did uh, case, uh, uh, they did some cases of this endoscopic transfer uh, for chronic and massive uh, tears of the gluteus medius and they just published the preliminary results. I think it's also possible to use uh, membranes uh, 
or biological membranes to to do this kind of repair or to reinforce the repair. Um, I find that that's not always that uh, that uh, needed to use because it gets in tissue tissue repair without having to augment. I feel that when we have to augment uh, with biobrace or other kind of membranes, probably we are just uh, one step away of having to do uh, muscular transfer. And just a little, uh, just a little bit on the snapping hip. What we have, I told you that uh, the um, ultrasound was a very good technique to diagnose this kind, sorry, this kind of, oh. and as you see, you can see the snap of the iliotibial band over the greater trochanter. And just what we do is some kind of, I, I, I tend to favor a diamond cut on the iliotibial band, as, we, as you see here. I start with a, a longitudinal cut, then a transverse cut, and sometimes I also go for a partial gluteus max tendon release, as you see on your right uh, image. This was published by a Brazilian group uh, of the group of Polezelo. And what I find is that when we do this partial release of the proximal third uh, or half of the gluteus max tendon, we see that it opens up. Okay, we go, we don't do a complete cut, we just release some of the tendon. And we can see that the peritrochanteric space opens up nicely and doesn't get that, uh, that tight as it was uh, on the beginning of the case. So uh, I don't know if you have some questions to, to ask. Uh, you can have my email and just email me and I will uh, and I will send you all the, all the papers, the chapter, or whatever you want. If you uh, some some advice, if you want to start on this field, because when we are starting, I think uh, all the input we can get it's uh, helpful for for getting over this learning curve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuriko, uh, for this amazing presentation. Yes, Yuriko, you can stop sharing. Uh, thank you, Yuriko, for this amazing presentation, a really cutting edge surgeries that you perform at Porto. And uh, Yuriko, a few questions. Now, Yuriko, do you always go intra-articular and finish the intra-articular work before going extra articular, because if you go extra articular first, there's going to be a lot of pressure and your intra articular is going to be difficult, right? Yeah, uh, I think these are separated problems. Uh, I would say that the majority of these greater trochanteric pain syndromes that we are working on, um, they have arthritic changes. So we don't do much of an intra articular work. We just go straight to the peritrochanteric space. We just try to fix the, the pain and fix the weakness the, the patients feel on the trochanteric uh, region, not going for intraarticular. Most of the patients are older, uh, probably tone is two or above, so with not a very good indication for intraarticular for intraarticular work. Uh, thank you, Yuriko, for that. And Yuriko, what about the use of traction? Now, you put all your patients on a traction table, right? But do you give traction for these extra articular work? Because you may need rotations, right? 
no uh, the, the the patients are on a standard operating table no traction uh, and just would we just leave the leg free just to get internal or external rotation if we need to rotate the greater trochanter uh, but no traction is used on this on these patients uh, for the intraarticular work we are now shifting towards postless distraction uh, that means we use the table in a Trendelenburg position and we just apply traction against the patient's own weight. We don't use a post anymore. Thank you, Yuriko, for that. And Yuriko, regarding the diagnosis of these conditions, it's sometimes very difficult, right? So you mentioned about getting an MRI done. Do you get an MR arthrogram before you actually do a hip scope? Do you think it's necessary? I would say that my, radio, the, the, my radiologist from the department would say that a three Tesla MRI with a specific hip sequence is enough. I would say that if I want to get a great detail or just to, I think it's, it's the, the, for, the, for labral tears, it's perfect if we use contrast because if we get some escape of the contrast, it's obvious that we have a labral tear. There is also a very good protocol from the Austrian colleagues from Innsbruck and Salzburg that they actually use a hip arthrogram with traction. And that gives beautiful images from the ligamentum terrace, from all the chondral labral junction because we just take the head out of the socket and we can get a, a good detail but i think we we are we we advise all the patients that probably they have a labral tear and if they have a labral tear we will do a labral repair uh, or a labral reconstruction so i don't i, I think i'm mainly focused on x-rays and especially x-rays that mimic the positions that i use uh, for hip arthroscopy so to compare the preoperative with the postoperative work. And I would say that probably in the most difficult hips, a CT with 3D reconstruction, so we can get a very good look at the bony work that we have to do probably is, uh, if I had to choose between an, an MRI or a CT with 3D reconstruction for the most difficult hips, I would go for the for the for the city with 3D reconstruction. Thank you, Yuriko. Yuriko, just one last question before we end up the session. Yuriko, there's something trending on hipscopy is ischiofemoral impingement, right? So yeah. how often uh, do you see that and what is your approach towards, because our talk is extra articular hip, that's why I brought out this particular topic. So we, this, these are, those are very different patients. That's mainly posterior pain, pain in the buttock, uh, with very specific in signs for impingement and some very specific signs for extra lumbar sciatic pain. Uh, we also tend to see on the MRI that they have narrower ischiofemoral spaces. That, that was the first description by the group of Toriani and Miriam Bradella in New York, and also lots of edema on the quadratus femoris. That, I would say, it's pathognomonic. Uh, most of these patients, actually, what they do have, and we measure that on our MRIs, because when I ask for an MRI, I, I always ask my radiologist to tell me what is the rotation of that femur. So that we just take some cuts from the knee, and then we, we, we check for the femoral torsion. And most of these patients have torsional problems. You can see also on the gait of the patients with in-towing or out-towing when they walk. But most of these patients, what they, what they have as, as, the, as the, the problem, the anatomic problem is a problem of femoral torsion or maltorsion. So it's just uh, important. First, I think most of them with the rehab, and some edu and some training on walking, they can correct some of the problem. I think one of the easier surgeries, if the patient is still symptomatic and if he doesn't mind to lose some flexion, um, some flexion strength, 
is to go for is to go for resection of the lesser true canter. Uh, that's is that's technically easier, but we do tend to 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 disrupt much of the iliopsoas tendon. And if we want to correct the full problem, I think we should go for a derotation osteotomy. But I think most of the patients, when we when you propose them a femoral derotation osteotomy, uh, um, I think if they they don't feel uh, it's it, they feel it's a very invasive procedure with the longer rehab. I think for younger patients, we should go for a femoral derotation because we solve all the problems with one surgery and without uh, without uh, disrupting any of the of the muscle and tendon mechanisms of the hip. Thank you, Rico. Uh, Eureka, that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this amazing presentation, and I'm sure this is going to reach a lot of people all over the world. Thank you very much for your invitation.